Hello and welcome to the Global Antitrust Institute Forum. Our guest today is William E. Kovacic, Bill Kovacic to most of us, uh, who has had a storied career in antitrust. And I'm going to uh, ask for Bill's indulgence for a moment while I uh, uh, recount some of that. Bill, actually, I think you first started your career in antitrust, uh, uh, at least early on, working for Senator Philip Hart as chairman of the uh, uh, antitrust subcommittee of, uh, of Senate Judiciary. Um, a, a, a good way to start, uh, one that I think probably uh, gave you a good dose of uh, skepticism uh, for the, <laughs> that's lasted ever since and served you well. But um, uh, Bill was uh, uh, at uh, the Bureau of Competition and the Planning Office from at the Federal Trade Commission from 1979 to, uh, to 83. He was an attorney advisor to Commissioner George Douglas, one of the few PhD economists who served as commissioners, um, who uh, Bill, after uh, being in private practice, uh, came back to the commission in 2001 as general counsel for a few years till 2004, uh, came back again in 2006 as a commissioner uh, until uh, 2009, including a full year stint as chairman of the commission. Uh, he's been teaching at George Washington at the Competition Law Center there at GWU. And um, I'm not sure if this is still true, Bill. Are you vice chairman of the International Competition Network at this stage? I'm not. Uh, when I left the FTC, I stepped down from, from that position. So I'm now just a non-government advisor. Well, uh, non-government advisor extraordinaire because uh, uh, Bill is, has advised no fewer than 16 countries. Uh, I'll take them alphabetically from Armenia to Zimbabwe, uh, perhaps the largest uh, country represented there being Russia. Uh, it's the federal anti-monopoly service there. Uh, Bill's provided uh, guidance to a large, large number of these 16. Almost all of them are were young agencies starting out when they got the, uh, the, the benefit of your uh, yeah. advice. And uh, you're now serving as a non-executive director of the UK Competition and Markets Authority. Since 2013, uh, the president. An extraordinary opportunity for, for the CMA and for you, I think, to uh, uh, be uh, sort of like a grandparent, you know, to having a lot of the pleasure, not all the responsibility <laughs> of running an agency. And, and, going, and for me, going back to school at the same time to, uh, to, to learn again. And, uh, and uh, the added pleasure perhaps it's worn off of living in London and teaching at King's College, uh, their law school. Still, still a real attraction. Yes. <laughs> good, good, I'm glad, I'm not surprised, I'm glad to hear it. Bill, one of the things that you've done in your academic career, um, and I'm sure you're consulting to agencies, uh, very much in, uh, involves the same thing, is a real uh, sustained and deep attention to institutional design. How, non, how national competition agencies work and should work and can work better. It's a, uh, an area that has not gotten nearly as much attention as, of course, substantive antitrust matters. Um, perhaps not as all the attention it deserves, but I think probably all the attention you can possibly give it because you've written so much in this area. And I'm particularly interested today in uh, your recent article with, with um, David Hyman, uh, called Implementing Privacy Policy, Who Should Do What? Uh, privacy policy having um, crept into, let's say, uh, perhaps been roped into the, um, the concerns of national competition agencies, including ours here in the US, Federal Trade Commission in particular, um, with a slow start, but I think now a fairly clear sense that the FTC needs to be concerned with privacy matters as it goes about its competition work. That uh, privacy is a dimension in which firms uh, can and do compete. Of course, it's also, it also works well with the agency's consumer protection function, uh, privacy being the protection of privacy and data privacy being closely related to consumer protection at large. So I'm going to, uh, before I turn it over to you, Bill, I want to just read a sentence from the abstract of this article to give our viewers a good sense of what you're talking about, or going to be talking about. But you wrote, the attention given to what, uh, to what, to the what of U.S. privacy regulation or data protection 
has overshadowed a consideration of how and by whom privacy policies, policy should be formulated and implemented. U.S. privacy policy is an amalgam of activity by a myriad of federal, state, and local government agencies, but the quality of substantive privacy law depends greatly on which agency or agencies are running the show. Unfortunately, such implementation-related matters have been discounted or ignored. And then finally, as things stand, the development and implementation of U.S. privacy policy is compromised by the murky allocation of responsibilities and authority among federal, state, and local government entities, compounded by the inevitable tensions among them. So I know you want to uh, concentrate on form, and we'll do that, not on the substance of what the privacy policy should be. You have, in the article, um, converged on two principal options for how the U.S. might do a better job in terms of institutional design. And one of the interesting things that throughout the article is your attention to the way in which U.S. privacy protection is viewed overseas, where as of now, I think you say it's just not taken seriously. Yeah, I think, I think we've, uh, in, in some ways, in the last uh, two decades, we've uh, assigned, been assigned a completely secondary role in the global environment. Um, the European Union uh, stepped forward with a number of initiatives uh, in their treaty, your Treaty of Europe, uh, privacy is treated as a fundamental human right, uh, uh, arguably a, a, a more robust uh, policy foundation than, uh, than our own privacy, privacy laws have. Uh, but uh, Europe has uh, assumed the principal global role in setting standards. And, that, and I must say, I'm, I'm grateful to GAI for the opportunity to discuss this with uh, uh, an institution that's playing such a crucial role in the development of, of sensible global norms. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, we've, we've had a secondary role. Um, and, and arguably now the, the, the GDPR, the uh, European Data Protection uh, Regulation, uh, is the preeminent uh, global standard. It doesn't command universal assent, uh, but, but in some interesting ways, it's become the US national privacy policy as well. And, and in, in crucial respects, it was a template for the uh, state of California, the California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, which uh, in some interesting ways is, uh, is, a, is the strongest formulation of national policy that we have now given California's role. Um, so we've, uh, we've, we've lost our ability in many ways to shape global standards as a, as a consequence. And we are a, a secondary voice. I, uh, Bill, I think that that could be said of areas other than privacy as well, that the uh, EU standards, which tend to be more restrictive, more, more strict uh, across a wide array of matters, are uh, increasingly those that are observed by the whole world, largely because they want to trade with the EU or deal with them, but, um, but also because it provides a convenient, uh, ready-made set of restrictions or regulations for uh, for smaller jurisdictions. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's true in a number of areas. Uh, one that, uh, uh, in which we have a, a deeply shared interest is uh, antitrust law, competition law, where uh, if we ask today uh, what, what jurisdiction plays the largest role in setting global standards for the treatment of uh, dominant firm behavior, uh, it's unmistakably the European Union uh, through its uh, its own enforcement program, its very extensive network of technical assistance programs, its uh, bilateral treaties involving trade, uh, its memoranda of understanding, and it's the compatibility of its framework to the civil law administrative framework that so many countries have. It's the dominant model globally uh, that uh, it's become the the leading influence in shaping views about what competition law should look like and what it what it should do, and there again, uh, the U.S. has uh, has a has a somewhat secondary role in that process. Something which certainly, when when both of us uh, became involved in this field, was uh, unimaginable. But it's uh, clearly the case now. Well, is the uh, does that mean that the best that the U.S. can do is to um, 
uh, have as little have a system in which the departure from European standards is as little as possible. So the conflict for U.S. companies uh, is, is is minimized. I, I think that uh, a couple of approaches would help us. One is uh, institutionally, our framework is so fragmented, um, so decentralized, without mechanisms for providing uh, uh, interaction and coherence among the different organizations, uh, that when we try to speak internationally, our, our voice is muddled uh, to a great degree. Uh, so one thing we can do to express our views and have a effective place in international discussions is to, is to work on improving our, our framework. But, but we also have a, a massive experience uh, and, and learning uh, from our academic centers, which are, are still preeminent in the world. We have the best intellectual infrastructure uh, uh, in, the, in the world today. There are other great ones, but, but we're still preeminent there. Um, we have a lot to say about how policy uh, should be developed and cautions to offer about uh, uh, the implementation challenges of specific approaches. So. Um, substantively, uh, I think we have a lot to offer about the future elaboration and refinement of, uh, of standards that in many ways have come, come out of Europe uh, and to offer our own, our own ideas about how those standards shall evolve. Uh, they will evolve. There will be refinements. We ought to have a leading role in how that happens. So is that because um, it's, um, it's valuable to the U.S. For, for third countries, not the EU, to follow the US, a US model if there were one, rather than the EU model? I think one is to, is to have a, a, a keen awareness uh, on the part of uh, emerging, emerging market economies uh, uh, that uh, uh, of what choices are embedded in the EU, EU framework, uh, that there are options that they might want to consider, uh, that uh, the E regime, though it's the product of decades of development and evolution, uh, uh, has features that might not be ideal for them. Uh, and, and, and we can point that out, not in a hostile way, but to say, uh, here are the consequences of adopting their framework. Uh, if it were uh, a bottle of pills, uh, we know a lot about the side effects. Uh, and, to, and to read that fine print carefully for people, because we understand what's involved in that process, and to say, that uh, even if you accept a number of the general principles that are embedded in the, in the GDPR, for example, uh, uh, there's no obligation on your part to, to, to take the, the whole thing off the rack without any tailoring and simply, and simply <laughs> put it on. Uh, nobody buys clothes that way, uh, and you shouldn't, buy, you shouldn't buy law and policy that way either. Uh, I think in many ways we can be good tailors in that respect. Well, you're speaking as though there could be a single U.S. policy that to which you're referring, but in the article, I think you stop short of suggesting that the federal government occupy this field to the exclusion of the states. Yeah, a, a, a really key issue for U.S. policy here and in many other domains is the, uh, the, the development of policy in our federal framework, uh, where state governments in so many areas have had a significant role in developing prototypes or templates that ultimately become absorbed into national law. Uh, and uh, the, the view that David Hyman, and I, I owe so much to David uh, on the faculty at Georgetown uh, to, to, the, to the work we've done here in this collaboration, um, we thought a lot about whether you'd preempt state decision-making uh, in this field. Uh, and, and our view from a practical perspective is that that might be the poison pill that kills the possibility of new legislation, that it's, uh, uh, it's a mountain too high to climb. Uh, but our other view uh, was that uh, you can get a long way towards coherence with better integration by contract, uh, to, to borrow uh, uh, from the work of Ronald Coase and, and others about the organization of the firm. Um, you can assemble functions by merger by actual integration, or you can integrate by contract, uh, by agreement. Uh, and uh, our suggestion is that we use a, a deeper web of agreements to go beyond what we have now to do that. Our other thought was that um, yeah, there's, there's still a lot of evidence that, that states have done interesting, useful things uh, as the proverbial Brandeisian laboratories 
uh, that, that create policy approaches that can be adopted. Uh, the states were really forerunners for, um, for do not call. Uh, they didn't develop a do not call mechanism that was truly effective, um, but, it, but it offered a way for the FTC to think about what to do when during Tim Muris's chairmanship, it, uh, it, uh, it promulgated the rule that, uh, that now provides some protection from unwanted uh, intrusions at home. So uh, as a practical matter, David and I thought uh, uh, seeking preemption is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is too hard to accomplish uh, in, in reframing the law. Uh, second, um, that you can get a long way toward better coherence uh, with uh, uh, more integration by integration by contract. Um, and third, uh, uh, in this area, states have done uh, some very useful work providing models, prototypes that have become useful bases for later federal legislation. Uh, we're hesitant at this time to, uh, to to stop that. Let me raise a concern about. Um retaining a state, a significant state role that I don't think came up in the article. And that is that, um, of course, companies that deal across the country would have to conform to whatever the national regulation is and whatever add-ons uh, individual states have, uh, have created. Uh, of course, any conflict would be resolved in favor of the federal rule. But, um, while uh, I'm not shedding a tear for the necessity of the of a large company that operates nationally to adapt itself to this multiplicity of different regimes, uh, I am concerned that it will create a significant um, uh, uh, barrier or burden for smaller companies who don't have the uh, scale that uh, the economies of scale in regulatory compliance. Yes, and when that happens, regulation has a a, a um, concentrating effect on markets. Um, it, we've seen this in any number of industries, as they, especially if you look at them when they first become regulated, the uh, the smaller players uh, are knocked out of it, and um, that it's it, it's unavoidable to some extent, but it's it's compounded if there are these multiple requirements imposed by various states. Yeah, I, th I think this is a crucial point and one that David and I didn't address and policymakers have to address. Uh, some of the great promise of electronic commerce was that it was going to make it possible for small operators uh, either to expand operations or to enter the market because suddenly um, you could reach customers in a way that you'd never do before. And as long as you had access to a delivery company, you had a distribution system now. Uh, and it meant that uh, 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 small businesses, which, of course, is a footnote, have attracted so much attention in debates and discussion about competition law and policy, debates about inequality, debates about the distribution of wealth and opportunity. You would think if, uh, if that's a core policy concern, uh, that you'd be very reluctant to impose burdens that uniquely disadvantage the development of those business operators and their entry and expansion in the market. Uh, and I think conceptually, the costs that you're referring to are genuine. Uh, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a large uh, Richard Wish, at, uh, my colleague at King's College, uh, emeritus on the faculty, refers to dominant firms, came up with the phrase of Domco. If I'm Domco, the dominant company, if I'm Domco, I can realize uh, scale economies from compliance. Uh, I can hire a big legal team uh, and figuring out what one more state is doing is not as expensive to a, to a small enterprise that doesn't have a general counsel or a, a, a team of regulatory compliance officers uh, giving advice. Uh, I think that effect uh, does get submerged in discussions about what the framework should look like. Uh, you know, as a, as a self-serving uh, academic observation, uh, I think we've spent as a whole, the, 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 the literature on business development um, has, has not um, sought to measure so completely what those costs are. Uh, that is an interesting research path, something that I would, I would hope would be part of the larger conversation that would come out of the more modest refinements of the system is that 
is that with academic hubs, that this becomes a, a specific focus of attention. Um, you know, I, I noticed uh, if you look at what California has done with its new Privacy Act, which took effect uh, in early January this year, you know, they, they have the traditional, there, there are exclusions for smaller enterprises. They have some. Um, and, and I guess a, uh, a, a question that uh, all of us ought to face, especially those of us who um, at the moment seem are, are content with maintaining uh, uh, the multiplicity of actors is that there, there has to be a mechanism to feed back uh, knowledge about what this is doing to smaller enterprises. Uh, because it is, after all, uh, this new, new and flourishing body of uh, entrepreneurs who are going to come into the market, whom we're counting on a great deal to uh, provide um, uh, vitality uh, to e-commerce, uh, and this is uh, this can be another barrier uh, for them. And and it's and it's and it's a barrier we overlook in a lot of areas of regulatory policy making. Um, I think what we should do is what others have done. We try to document just, just what that barrier is. Uh, a problem is you, you will never know about the people who thought about doing it, wanted to do it, and never did. We'll never see them. Right, right. They're the customers who didn't buy at the cartel price. Yes. yes. <laughs> Often overlooked. Yes. Um, so um, there are a number of adaptations to this problem that we see in other areas. One is, and you mentioned this, uh, is uh, something like the uh, uniform commissioners for of state laws that have emerged to deal with a variety of subjects, including the uh, uniform uh, commercial code. Um, so this, so that we could have a situation in which, although the states are free to create variations from the federal norm, uh, they collectively uh, come together and and hammer out an agreement for most of it that they can all adhere to. Another would be um, the emergence of two or more regional models as we have with uh, cafe standards in, in, in uh, automobiles where California sets its own standard by legislative grace from the federal government and a number of states have adopted the California standard. I think these two have uh, great promise to uh, advance uh, uh, the development of better standards. Uh, I, I especially like the, uh, the UCC model uh, simply by reason of uh, teaching contracts for, for, a, for, for, for a number of years. But, but, but the, uh, it, it's interesting how as a whole, we have not drawn upon that experience as a way of thinking about how we might achieve greater coherence in other areas of policymaking. Uh, the kinds of interaction that we have among the decision makers tend to be more informal. Uh, they tend to be focused more on specific enforcement matters, but we're lacking for a mechanism that for this area of policymaking would bring together these decision makers with the aim of developing uh, a suggested norm or template with the UCC model of opting in. That is, you, you come up with something that is arguably a good synthesis of what you've got, the core principles, and, and people opt in. And that's, uh, as you know, that's how the UCC worked. Uh, the commissioners came up with a proposal. Nobody had to join it. Uh, the proposal was published in the late 50s. And in fairly quick fashion, uh, the states get on board. And, and one would think we could do that in other areas too. Now, you start to wonder what, what would be the hub where that would take place. Uh, uh, does it start, for example, with an academic institution uh, saying, uh, let's, uh, let's do a, a rough prototype of this process and think about what it might look like? Uh, is it a non-government organization like a large trade association? There are a number of those. Uh, is, there, is there a place for the public decision makers to decide, let's create a network that consciously does this. Um, people resist the idea, we got too much to do. This is another administrative burden. Uh, it's all overhead, why bother? Uh, but uh, uh, something that they might decide is, is worthwhile as well. Uh, I think we've learned a lot from these other areas of activity that you can, you can come up with an approach that offers a better way ahead. 
with exactly the flexibility you mentioned, Doug. Uh, that is in the UCC, you go state by state, they have they have variations, but 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 it, there's enough predictability that you know with a great deal of certainty if you're picking up the phone in New York, calling someone in Los Angeles whom you've never met, uh, and you're a contracting person, you have a pretty good idea what the common rules are, and and that would be desirable. What about casting a wider net, um, looking externally? Uh, it would seem that this would be a it would be a I, I would think a significant advantage if the three NAFTA countries were to have a common privacy policy. Oh, let's start there. Yes, uh, I think, I think a, I mean, a, we're operating a in one market. Uh, We've successfully created a single North American market. A North American market uh, from the canal, basically roughly from the canal up to the, uh, up to the Arctic Circle. Um, uh, we, have, uh, we have the essence of a single market. And uh, in so many areas of policymaking, uh, uh, shouldn't the NAFTA countries be taking a lead in this area and others? Uh, uh, shouldn't the NAFTA companies, for example, have a, a common pre-merger notification form? Uh, shouldn't at least the United States and Canada uh, have that? The English-speaking peoples. Uh, so, but, so you're telling uh, me it's hopeless because we don't even have that. <laughs> uh, but but I, I think it's a, I think it's a, uh, it's a poverty of imagination. And, and, and maybe this is something that our, uh, our academic hubs uh, can do better, is to draw out um, what we've actually learned and, and learned quite effectively and say, we're not going to conquer the world, but we're going to try a step at a time with a prototype uh, that's focused on uh, a single area. I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think a lot about uh, how Australia and New Zealand, uh, for all kinds of reasons of geography, decided over time through a series of steps to uh, converge their legal systems dramatically for competition law. They, the, 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 the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission and the New Zealand Commerce Commission have, in effect, interlocking directorates on their boards. Uh, 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 they, they work in so many ways with a common regime. Uh, um, and you know, your NAFTA example is a, is a, is a, is a great one. You know, rather than trying to think of bringing the whole world together in a giant room to try and do this. Let's start with countries that, that do operate in a, in a highly integrated market. And despite all the upheaval about trade globalization, one expects that will continue, uh, that uh, we'll continue to have that. Let's start there. Uh, uh, because a lot of the relationships are built already uh, across the public agencies. Um, uh, they, they, they have a good enough relationship, why not take additional steps there and, and use that as the model that shows it works, test different approaches. Uh, I think that is a great deal of promise. Let's turn to uh, an aspect of the, uh, of the paper that um, is, uh, is prominent. Um, it starts, uh, it, it emerges gradually, but seems inevitable from the start. And that is your suggestion that the federal role be assigned to the Federal Trade Commission to a much greater extent than it now is, uh, that the uh, sectoral exemptions uh, that appear, that, that deprive the commission of jurisdiction, not only with regard to, to uh, privacy, but with regard to, uh, to uh, competition as well, be eliminated so as to create a single uniform privacy regime uh, at the federal level. Uh, and that the uh, not just the, uh, the legal authorities, but the resources associated with them be brought into the agency in order to handle that additional task. The alternative being a standalone privacy agency. So uh, apart from your having spent much of your career inside the FTC, apart from your having been chairman of it. Building, uh, of building an old empire out. <laughs> yeah. Apart from the rest of us we agreeing that uh, you've done a splendid job there. Yeah. Um, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of those two approaches? Uh, the advantages are that there's a lot of expertise already resident in the agency. And if you're thinking of, uh, in some ways, an administratively most feasible, least burdensome way of scaling up an existing capability, you do it where you already have the competence. Uh, and, and the FTC in many ways has that in, uh, in rulemaking, 
with respect to privacy in law enforcement using uh, the unfair or deceptive, unfair or deceptive acts or practices element of Section 5 of the FTC Act, uh, writing reports, convening events. The FTC's got lots of the relevant experience, uh, so you can scale it up. Uh, um, and, and, that, and that would also, one hopes, achieve a, a good integration across its other areas of expertise. Uh, sensitivity, one would hope, to competition and exactly the point you mentioned before, Doug, about, about you know, what do regulatory burdens do to entry and expansion by smaller enterprises? Uh, the FTC has some culture of being attentive to that. Uh, uh, so you get the multidisciplinary integration in theory. Um, you have an institution that's done a lot of this already and can, can build outward, uh, arguably at a lower cost. Uh, and you've got a, a mechanism in place uh, which if you knock out the exceptions that we've referred to before, and some of them are massive not-for-profit organizations, uh, 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 common carriers, um, then you have a, a good platform to work on this. Um, caveats, you know, what could go wrong? Uh, well, well, let me stop you at that yeah. point for just a moment. Sure. Because the agency, the commission, of course, already has and long has had both antitrust, let's say competition and consumer protection functions. And if I ask myself, well, has the presence of the antitrust function informed the consumer protection function? I remain skeptical because the consumer protection function seems so, I think Josh Wright called it, uneconomized. Yep. yep. <laughs> right? I mean, the, the, the change in the uh, competition bureau in, in the last 40 years, have been, and uh, you mentioned there are 80 PhD economists in the agency. Um, I doubt very much that, I don't know, but I would doubt you tell me whether many of them are on the consumer protection side. Uh, there's been a, a, a gradual, but I would agree with Josh, not adequate uh, elevation of the consumer economics analytical ca capacity and integration into the consumer domain, but it's, uh, it's improved. Uh, uh, you know, if we, if we look back maybe 25 years ago, I don't know that we'd have any of those PhD economists who would be, who would have been trained in what we have called uh, a consumer economics, which is largely information economics, but information economics with a, a specialization in, uh, in, the, in the consumer facing side of, uh, of, uh, of what the FTC does. Um, now there are, there are several of those people, um, good ones coming out of PhD programs, who've written PhD uh, involving data protection, privacy, uh, uh, the whole set of modern consumer issues that are elaborations of earlier, what I suppose IO economists would have called information economics. Uh, it's better, but the balance isn't what it should be. Uh, I, I think some of the, you, you can point to, um, I, I'm going to mention a couple of examples, but I'm ultimately going to put my arms up and surrender and say that uh, if, you, if you were looking for, if you were looking for broad evidence of the integration of the insights of the functions, um, it would be hard to see. You've seen, uh, you've seen the competition ethic make their way into specific rules that have been very beneficial. The, uh, uh, my favorite is the um, eyeglasses rulemaking from the mid 1970s that made it possible for those of us who wear these things uh, all the time uh, to get the copy of the prescription uh, when we leave the <laughs> ophthalmologist and shop to get the portability. Free. Portability, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was a competition law insight that came through the Bureau of Economics and the IO economists who said, uh, if you suppress that kind of portability, you're going to have an entirely different market for frames and lenses. Uh, uh, that was a competition perspective. Uh, the competition... Uh, but didn't that, didn't that insight come from the, uh, the Lee Benham's article? Uh, yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, from, outside the, from academic work. From academic work, which uh, through a process of osmosis makes its way into the institution. You know, it's not, it's not, it made its way from the journals into the bloodstream of the organization. Uh, and I would say mainly through the Bureau of Economics, uh, which uh, did, the, did, the, uh, did the, trans, 
the transfusion. Um, and uh, other examples, there's some good other examples of how, how that's taken place. Uh, and, I, and I'd say the other uh, disciplinary function, and I, I don't have a robust proof for this, uh, has been to make the Bureau of Consumer Protection um, uh, more wary of the notion that consumers are invariably fragile, are always prone to be fooled, and thus always prone to be exploited. Uh, and, and I'd say that view has been tempered through the juxtaposition. But, but uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you said uh, um, you're standing against the wall with a blindfold and we're going to shoot you unless you give us 10 really good examples <laughs> of integration, I'd say keep the blindfold and, and fire away. Uh, I'd say, give me a cigarette, but smoking's bad for you, and we don't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think uh, I think the, um, the 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 big the big question in the in the proposal that David and I uh, make is, uh, you, you guys talk about these conceptual policy synapses and interconnections, but. What basis do we have in past experience to see that they've really worked in the way that's intended? And at that point, we can summon up some examples, we can sum up some changes in culture, uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, difficult, it's difficult to show deep policy integration. As you know, the fact that you put a lot of functions under the same roof does not mean that they will work together and interact well. And I, but I'd say one, one thing that, um, if you did create a standalone data protection authority, uh, would it have a Bureau of Economics? Uh, would it have the economic analysis group that we have in the antitrust division and at, at the Department of Justice? Um, would you have uh, strong academic analytical capability that would, that would seek to inform policymakers about these larger issues that we're, that, that we're, that we're talking about? I guess a gamble that David and I are making in part is that there's a greater likelihood that that would happen at the FTC. Um, I do have some other, some other, other side effects. Uh, there's a strong chance it would be the end of the FTC's antitrust function. Um, that well, is I was going to ask you about that because uh, yes, of course, one could say, well, as long as we're about this, let's have the consumer protection and data privacy functions in the FTC and take the competition aid functions and put them over at the Justice Department where they already reside yes, yes. in a duplicative way. Uh, but that, of course, would, would mean losing any hope of the integration you've just described. Yeah, unless it were, unless the Bureau of Economics capability was retained in a significant way uh, and injected into the decision making, uh, it, it would be. I think a challenge that would happen, the way we would see it happen, if you, if you build up the, the privacy role, which probably means hiring, goodness knows, uh, maybe a couple hundred more people than you have now uh, to play the larger role. When you look at the pie chart of the FTC's budget, uh, after you did that, all of a sudden, the, 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 the antitrust slice of the pie gets smaller and smaller. Right. And I think you said it's... Uh... It, consumer protection is now about 54% of the budget. Correct. Correct. And if you, if you made this further adjustment and, and made it the real data protection authority, um, you know, maybe it shrinks to about a quarter. And you start wondering when you look at that pie uh, and you say, why is this narrower slice here? Uh, doesn't it make more sense to put that capacity two blocks down the street uh, at the department? Why not do that? Um, and I, I, think a, I think a side effect, uh, a consequence of this, would be it would catalyze a basic rethink of what you want the FTC to do, and perhaps lead down a path that makes it the National Consumer Protection Authority uh, rather than the competition authority that it is now. Uh, and, and again, would you have, if that happened, would you have this residual uh, presence of the Bureau of Economics that would do consumer economics in the way we've been saying in so many ways uh, in the FTC's history, that's been a function of who the chair is and what the leadership team wants. If the chair wants it, it gets integrated. If the chair is indifferent, it tends mm -hmm. not to be. Uh, so I, I guess it's a, it's a real banality to say that the leadership counts. Uh, what a surprise across all institutions 
But in this respect, in achieving the actual integration, it is very much the preferences of the chair who has operational roles to play inside the building to, to say, make it happen and to stand on that element of the agenda over time. And you could get a lot of variation in, in how that, how that role is played. It was a commonplace uh, when I was in the Reagan administration that uh, to say that um, personnel is policy. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, you know, it's it's a I guess uh, I guess if we were to submit a paper that that emphasized that again and again for uh, different observers, they would say, uh, "What's new here? Um, uh, you just found this out." But I, I think I think those well, that, that was forty five years ago, yeah. <laughs> whatever it was, a long time. Yeah, but part of part of what uh, part of what I've seen in a separate set of interviews that we've done for the the publication Concurrence, which uh, you generously participated in, you now we've we've interviewed uh, uh, about twenty five former heads of authorities, uh, some current but mostly former heads of authorities, and. And when you do the, the bit of research that looks at the, uh, the, the institutions they led, um, again and again, uh, you know, if we were to use a, a Formula One racing analogy, which my UK friends like to use, uh, there are two really key determinants to how well your team does. Uh, it's, the, it's the driver in the car. Um, in Formula One, the car tends to be most important. Uh, it's the best car, the hottest car, the strongest car, the fastest car that's the key determinant. You can take a, a good but not great driver and that car will tend to win. But the other determinant, if you have equally matched cars, it's driver. The driver is so important. And, and when, you, when you talk to Formula One people about uh, what the key to success is, they say car and driver. And yes, <laughs> supporting team, but and driver. Uh, and, and I think for our for our agencies, maybe maybe the mix is a bit different. Maybe the driver is even more important um, uh, than the than the than the design of the vehicle, the tools that you have. That comes through again and again. And uh, I think I think one thing again, if you think of what our our academic institutions can do, uh, is how do we bring how do we bring home to those who are going to have these leadership roles and maybe a couple of tiers below. Uh, how do we bring home to them? Uh, the idea of what they can do to be more effective in that job. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm greatly impressed at how uh, Australia and New Zealand have created a, a hub like that uh, in Melbourne, University of Melbourne, the Australian New Zealand School of Government, uh, to try and play that role in a more effective way. Mm. We have important variants of that in the United States, of course, the Kennedy School, the Wilson School, the Maxwell School. Um, they do this, but but, but, but maybe there's a, there's a role for the organizations we're familiar with to do that a bit more, to make that make the lessons of what all of us have learned more accessible because the, the personnel, you will only go as far as your people will carry you, uh, both at the top and through the staff. In that respect, the U.S. may be a little bit of a disadvantage because we turn people over so rapidly. Um, at the Justice Department, I think the average tenure for a political appointee is a little less than two years, maybe about two years, of course, a variation around the average, around the mean. Um, but we've had long time incumbents in, uh, in uh, Rod Sims in Australia, in uh, Alejandro Palacios in, in Mexico, uh, in a number of countries that have, and her predecessor, of course, Eduardo Perez Mota, countries that have made huge strides have done so in those instances and probably many others with a lot of continuity in the leadership. I, I think that is so much worth our, our, our institutions. Again, maybe underscored by our academic institutions like GAI, like others, uh, to say that uh, um, we, ought to, we ought to study much more carefully what we're seeing from these other, other, other bodies, including newer ones. Uh, uh, some amount of, of churn is, is a source of vitality. People come in with good ideas. Uh, um, you know, you know uh, any number of very effective heads of our agencies have come in with great ideas uh, and, and put them in place. Uh, and that's been, a, it's been good for our system. If the door spins too quickly, 
And both at the top and through the upper management levels, there is not enough continuity. Um, two things go wrong. One is that uh, there's the lost awareness and understanding of what the last people did. We have a somewhat unfortunate tendency in our system uh, uh, for newcomers to come in and say, uh, I've inherited a leper colony. I'm a great do doctor. I'm going to heal it. You have another regime change, and they say, no, I'm the doctor, and it's still a leper colony, and I'm going to heal it. And, and the new doctors don't pay enough attention to what worked well. I, I, think, I think some of what we see in lots of these other organizations, uh, when we talk to, you know, Mexico is such a great example, which started out with a very weak system in the early 90s, uh, extremely limited powers, and step by step, there's an incremental accumulation of effort that, that made it a much more effective institution. Um, if we don't take advantage of those incremental steps and we go through a long period of time and we denounce all of it uh, and then uh, slowly realize, God, you know, those, those lepers did something that was worthwhile. Uh, <laughs> they did a few things that were good and, and maybe rebrand them. Uh, we, we just sacrifice opportunities to, to, to learn uh, and advance. And, and a number of our foreign counterparts and, and the one I'm, I'm in the United Kingdom, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this contrast as well. Uh, greater continuity, greater commitment to a common cause on top, um, more people who come and stay for a larger period of time in, in key decision-making positions. That's wasn't, a uh, wasn't Andrea Caselli just renewed for another five years as director? Indeed he was, and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, an, an exceptionally capable leader. Um, you know, the handoff between the, the former chair, David Curry, and Andrew Tyree, uh, uh, a very good one. Uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I see a lot of things day in and day out in the U United Kingdom that I wish, as a matter of culture and practice, uh, I could take into the to the U.S. But this is one of them. Well, I uh, hope you'll they, transplant some things you've learned in the U.S. into the U.K. <laughs> there are a couple of things. I, uh, I, uh, I, 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 use, I use my voice to say, "Have you thought of it this way?" But, uh, but, I, but, I, but I think in so many ways. Uh, You've pointed to newer authorities, and I count the ACCC as a relatively newer authority. Uh, its modern life begins in the 80s and comes forward. Um, a lot of newer authorities have done things that um, are worth a good look for us. And, and in some ways, I fear we're missing a good game because we don't study more uh, uh, what they've done, how they've done it, and think, uh, how can we do it better ourselves? And, and, and maybe, that's, uh, maybe that's part, again, part of the exciting possibility that's inherent in a group like GAI, in an institution like GAI, uh, is to draw the connections and to draw them out to U.S. policymakers. Well, thank you. We do have the advantage at GAI that when we offer an economics institute for antitrust officials or for competition law judges, it's a two-way street. We learn about what their regimes do from their questions and from our questions to them. So there's a lot of cross fertilization there. In fact, we refer to the process as a collaborative one. I, uh, uh, I think, I think sometimes, sometimes uh, when you're in the room uh, listening to them, they don't feel really, fully realize that uh, you are just as much the student as they are. Uh, and, um, and you know that, that collaboration has been so valuable. Lifelong learning. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for uh, spending this time with, uh, with me and with GAI and with all of our, our viewers. It's been really interesting. I'm going to just take a moment to tell, remind everybody the article is Implementing Privacy Policy, Who Should Do What? Uh, with uh, David Hyman and, uh, and Bill Kovacic. And it appears in the Fordham Journal of um, Intellectual Property and uh, Media and Entertainment. Uh, I think we could just say Fordham Intellectual Property. You'll be able to find it uh, with, with those cues. That'll work. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's always great to, uh, to have some time with you. I'm, I'm glad we had this opportunity, even though we couldn't get together in person this time. No, thanks for the chance to do this, Doug. And, uh, and again, cheers for the, the good work of the GAI and its continued well, thank you. efforts to provide, again, uh, to be the intellectual hub, to provide the infrastructure and the and the, and the network that, that makes some of these policy ideas uh, take root in practice. And remember, you're a flag planted at the CMA, a U.S. flag. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Doug.